Hello, and welcome to this video for Physics 132, where I will go through the first exam for Spring 2018. The purpose of this video is to go through each multiple choice question and provide a full solution. This video will only go through the multiple choice questions, as the rubric already has full solutions for the two long answers. So let's begin with questions number one and two, which dealt with this concave mirror. Now there were two ways actually to approach this pair of problems. The first way was to simply draw the ray diagram for this situation using the arrow that comes from the center, meets the mirror at a right angle and bounces straight back in parallel and out using the focal point, in using the focal point, and then out parallel, giving us an image about here. Now it's possible to see that the image is outside the radius of curvature and it will be positive because the image is on the same side as the outgoing light. Thus, 1.5 r is the only possible option. Furthermore, we can see that the image is going to be real, the rays do converge to that point, and the image is larger than the original object, so b. Another way to solve this problem was to go through and actually solve it out mathematically. To find the image position, we would use 1 over i plus 1 over o equals 1 over f. We know that the object position o is 3r over 4. We know that the focal length is r over 2. Simplifying the fractions within fractions, then we subtract 4 over 3r over to the other side of the equation find a common denominator, do the subtraction, and then get the reciprocal, and we will see that the image distance is in fact positive 3r over 2, which is equivalent to what we found with our ray diagram. For the magnification, we would begin with minus i over o, the expression connecting the magnification image and object distances that we found in class, substitute in our image and object distances, uh, the 3r's cancel, uh, simplify our fractions within fractions, and we get a magnification of minus 2, minus indicating that the image is inverted, which we see from our picture. Question number 3 was asking about an electron wave, a proton wave, and a light wave, all with the same wavelength, asking which one has the highest momentum. The correct answer is that all three of these particles must have the same momentum. This question involved moving around what I called the quantum map. The key expression is the connection between momentum and wavelength that works for all particles, both matter and light. We can see that since all the particles have the same wavelength, they will have the same momentum. Question number four dealt with a particle in a box going to a lower energy state. This was essentially conservation of energy and particle in a box and a little bit of moving around the quantum map. Really synthesized everything we talked about in our first unit into one problem. The initial state is n equals 5. We see that there are five peaks or troughs in the picture. The final state is n equals 1. Just the single peak, that's the ground state. In terms of conservation of energy, I begin in the fifth energy state and end up in the n equals 1 state while producing a photon. So my conservation of energy equation reads E5 equals E1 plus the energy of the photon, E gamma. The energy of the fifth energy state is h squared phi squared over 8 ml squared. The energy of the first energy state is h squared 1 squared over 8 ml squared. Subtracting the cross, we get h squared times 25 minus 1 over 8 ml squared. We know it's an electron, so that gives us the mass, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. The length of the box, 6.88 nanometers, is given in the problem, and h is a constant, giving us the energy of the emitted photon. Then we just need to convert to wavelength using this relation, hc over lambda, which comes from E equals hf for a photon, and c equals lambda f. The result will be b. 
Question number five dealt with the cracked lens. The correct answer was E, none of these. We did this particular demo in class, essentially, on the 14th of February, where instead of cracking the lens, I covered up part of it with a sheet of cardboard. And the key point from that demo was that all the light from the lens is used to make the image. So when I remove part of the lens, all that happens is less light goes into making the image. So the image gets dimmer. It is not impacted in its shape. Question number six dealt with the intensity of a green laser. The correct answer were that one and two were both true. The amplitude of the light wave at the spot got larger and the number of photons hitting the given spot got larger. This question was really about switching between the particle picture and wave picture for photons. Since the wavelength is constant, 560 nanometers, the frequency must be constant and thus the energy of the individual photons also cannot change, which means that option three cannot be true. In the particle picture, a brighter light, higher intensity is due to more photons, which means number two must be true. In particular, the number of photons hitting the spot must increase. In the wave picture, higher intensity corresponds to higher amplitude. In particular, we have the equation I equals one half C epsilon naught E squared, which implies that one is true. Question number seven dealt with an incident light in a material going into the air. This was an application of Snell's law. We know the incident index of refraction, 1.5. We know the incident angle, 45 degrees the outgoing index of refraction, since it's air, is just 1. The result is 1.06 for sine theta 2. Sine can't possibly be larger than 1. Therefore, the result must be total internal reflection, which must obey the law of reflection, theta i equals theta f, which means the light will bounce back at a 45 degree angle, as shown which means that none of these choices is in fact correct. Given that sine theta 2 was 1.06, and given that in class I asked you to round in a similar problem, I ended up giving credit for choice 3. Problem number 8 was, in my opinion, the hardest problem on the exam, and we discussed this in class in some detail on the first day of Unit 3. The basic story was that we had an incoming electron with some amount of energy, and it loses some of that energy to a photon as it continues to go. So our initial energy is 10 keV. Uh, we don't know what the final energy of the electron is, and we're looking for the final energy of the photon. At the end, we know that the energy is all kinetic, so 1 half mv squared, I know the mass of the electron, and I gave the final speed of the electron. 5.7 times 10 to the 7th meters per second. Chugging all that out, we were able to calculate the energy of the photon, and then we just had to move around the quantum map to get the wavelength. And the correct answer ended up being C. Question number 9 was actually somewhat similar um, to question number 8. Ascent. Initially, the electron had 20 keV of potential energy and 30 keV of kinetic energy. And then after leaving the region of interest, the potential energy goes to zero. So in terms of conservation of energy, we have Ui plus Ki equals Kf, which means the final kinetic energy of the electron was 50 keV, the 20 plus the 30. Now we just convert to the wavelength of the electron. We know how to convert from kinetic energy to momentum, p squared over 2m. This was discussed in part of your prep for unit 1. And then we can convert from momentum to wavelength using the de Broglie relation. This brings us to option D. Question 10 dealt with atomic transitions. And this was, yet again, conservation of energy and moving around the quantum map. For both electrons, we have an initial potential energy 
and a final potential energy, where the final potential energy was less than the initial. Both were negative, but the final potential energy was more negative. In the process of going from the initial state to the final state and losing some energy, that energy went into the photon. In particular, the photon's energy would be ui minus uf or minus delta u, which given that ui and uf were both negative would give you a positive photon energy. The difference in potential energy is larger for electron 2 than it is for electron 1. As electron 2 gets closer to the nucleus, it has a larger change in potential energy, which means that the photon for electron, two trans electron 2's transition will be a higher energy photon, and therefore higher frequency, and therefore shorter wavelength. This concludes this video.